Hello, everyone. I'm Anthony Painter. I'm Chief Research and Impact Officer uh, at the RSA, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to today's event. Uh, I'm delighted to have the chance to talk today to Hilary Cotton um, and to Mark Steers. Um, Hilary Cotton, OBE, uh, is an international acclaimed social entrepreneur working with communities and governments around the world uh, to design collaborative, affordable solutions to big social challenges. Hilary's book, Radical Health, on the Future of Welfare was published to widespread acclaim uh, in June 2018. In fact, Mark in his book describes it as the textbook on social change. Um, I'd also like to recommend that you read, um, that you see Hillary's TED Talk, which has had over 750,000 uh, views. Her current work focuses on the need for a fifth social revolution and uh, to enable widespread flourishing in a century as work, society and our economies go through deep structural change and she's an honorary professor at the UCL Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose and she was awarded her OBE in 2019 for services to the welfare state. Mark Steers um, was a senior advisor and chief speechwriter to um, Ed Miliband um, when he was leader of the Labour Party uh, in the UK and now directs uh, the Sydney Policy Lab um, at the University of Sydney. He's author of Demanding Democracy uh, and progressives, pluralists, and the problems of the state. His latest book, Out of the Ordinary, what a great title. It's a great book as well, and we're going to have a fantastic conversation around it. And the subtitle is How Everyday Life Inspired a Nation, How It Can Again, um, has just been published, and I've had the privilege of reading an advanced copy. It's a wonderful book, and it sets out a, a, a very inspiring vision for everyday democracy as a route to political and social progress and uh, Hillary's done the honours and displaying the book there for you all so there'll be no mistaking it when you find it online. Um, you'll find links to both Mark and uh, Hillary's books in their Twitter handles on the RSA website uh, and in the YouTube uh, video notes. Hillary, Mark, welcome and thank you for um, joining us. It's great to have you both with us. Um, I'm going to start off with 2020 um, and um, as we go into 2021, uh, in the UK at least, um, it, it's it's a strange moment of sort of a mix of sort of fear, tragedy and hope. Um, we're still fearful about where we're heading. Um, yesterday, um, we saw over, over 1,200 deaths. There's tragedy in every single one of those and tragedy for every family and friendship circle that's connected with those um, individuals. We have this strange mix with, with hope as the vaccine rollout gathers pace. But what did we bring into this moment from 2020? I'd be interested to get your views um, on this. What did we learn about ourselves in the past year or so of pandemic? It is almost uh, a year now. In fact, it is a year, in fact. Um, because it could have been a lot worse in many respects. Um, it's been a difficult year. And that, that burden has weighed down on particular individuals in particular circumstances, but we've all had to face challenging circumstances um, in different ways. But my reflection is it could have been far worse. Things didn't break down. People did hold together um, somehow, difficult though may it be. Is that an over-optimistic take or does that feel like it's in the right sort of territory? Hilary, where are you with this? Well, it's it's true that reflecting on this conversation, coming to this conversation that we're in a really different place. You know, I think a year ago, we would have been talking about how neighbours were helping each other, which they still are. We would have been talking about clapping for carers. And, you know, instead yesterday we had, you know, Cressida Dick, uh, the head of the Metropolitan Police, talking about how to enforce lockdowns. So it's, it's a much darker moment. Um, you've talked about the fact that sadly, so many people are dying. We know that frontline workers are now suffering deep crisis from going through all of this again without a break. So it's undoubtedly a really different time to, to the beginning. Um, but I think that it's still, it, well, it's still very important. The fractures are very important because what we've learned is that first of all, everything was not fine before, which I think we should talk about that, you know, this has shone a light on the deep inequalities, the structural differences between us that we absolutely have to address to move forward. Um, we can also see that deeper work is happening, that neighbors are still helping each other, that really 
hopefully we can talk about sort of radical work of the imagination that I see happening in the communities that I'm talking about, a really different turn from sort of what was previously sort of innovation within services to a really big rethinking of what can happen. People have sort of taken off their lanyards, they've put aside the risk frameworks and they're working together in a really different way and experiencing that practical working together, which I think is important. And then the other thing that I hope we can touch on is that ideas are growing. So I think really important is the sort of greater noise and depth around a kind of new economic orthodoxy, which we absolutely need to move forward and sort of which has that nexus with the social ideas that Mark and I will are writing about and hopefully we'll talk about. Uh, it's interesting, isn't it? I think we kind of have allowed ourselves over time to lose faith in many respects um, in sort of solidarity and community. I see those as sort of vestiges or nostalgias or so on. And I, 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 I sense we've rediscovered the value of, 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 so I don't want to overstate the case, but I think we've rediscovered there is something that is common in our lives. But can um, I just tell is, one, yeah, just one tiny anecdote about this, which I tell in Radical Help, which is that with the work we did, which was all about, you know, bringing people together, um, a relational approach to kind of solving social problems. Whenever we went to local authorities, they'd look at the business case and they'd say, oh, well, it will obviously save us money, but people will never come together here. You know, it won't work yeah. here. And absolutely, yeah. we could not say that now, could we? And that is fundamentally important because everywhere we've seen people come together. So that's really important important yeah and pe people have leaned in and they've, they've 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 rediscovered the value of that of that of that connection um, and and it is related to place i think mark where, where are you with this what can we take with us as as we, we we travel through the next year i mean it's been extraordinarily difficult to watch the uk from overseas is the is the first thing i want to say i mean it's just um you know, it's, it always feels weird being away because I love Britain so much and I spent most of my life thinking about British society and British politics. And so being uh, on the other side of the world, you always feel a little bit you know, stepped back. But during the pandemic, it's been so much worse just because of um, the difficulties that the British government has clearly had at every step of the way. Um, the reflection, the biggest reflection I take, you know, is my new home here in Sydney in New South Wales, you know, we're a vast multicultural city, smaller than London, but still, you know, a large global city. Um, and we've had well under 100 deaths in the entire pandemic. Um, and that's for many complex reasons. Australia has many advantages over other countries. You know, it's a, it's a long way away from lots of other places and it's been able to close its borders. But I think actually the biggest learning for us um, has been the, the success of the Australian pandemic response has been its smallness, and there's a paradox there. It's relied on localized public health infrastructure and not on big grand moonshot programs. You know, it hasn't brought in companies which have never run a public health program before and given them billions of pounds and expected them to solve the problem. Uh, instead, it's used, you know, very grassroots um, health, local health systems. Uh, people who are in close contact with their communities who understand the, um, the nature of the labour market here, the nature of family relationships, the nature of where people do their shopping. Um, and, you know, again and again throughout the pandemic, Track and Trace has worked in Sydney and across New South Wales. Um, we've had small clusters, but they've been kept down by a very local community-led health response. And it's been extremely inspiring to see that. Um, and, you know, you come out of there thinking there's nothing very flash about it. It's nothing very grand. And, and of course, you know, we, we here in Australia haven't, haven't invented the vaccine. So, you know, it's not as if we've got the solution to the pandemic. Um, but nonetheless, in terms of dealing with a, a big social emergency, it's just shown the benefit uh, of actually being in quick touch with people on the ground. Uh, and as I say, not being too flash, not being too grandiose and not looking for always the big single solution, but being prepared to work from the micro level up. I think two things have been shocking in that in that respect. You know, one one is you know if there is an argument for surrendering autonomy and democracy to a national administration, its competence and capability, but actually we've we've seen quite the opposite. We've seen there 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 has been sort of slowness of decision making, lack of coordination, lack of preparedness, lack of ability to communicate um, in in a sensitive um, and and effective way. But nonetheless there seems to be a general mood of, well, this was tough and it would have been tough for any sort of administration, tough for any sort of government. So, you know, they've done their best and yeah, it hasn't gone well, but you know, they had a, they had a, they had a hard um, deck of hands to, 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 to play with. Do, do you see that there's a sort of paradox in that? Or, or do you think that paradox is sustainable? 
Look, I think that uh, just yeah. I mean, I think there's a huge problem here, which we all have to be open about and confront. Which is, of course, you want to give you know politicians or civil servants the benefit of the doubt in a huge crisis like this, and you know it's perfectly legitimate for people uh, to say you know who who would want to be in their shoes. On, on the other hand, you've got to have really high expectations of what is delivered. As you say, Anthony, it's a brilliant point that, that you know, the only reason that they have power is in order to execute it for the common good. And if they're not doing that, they have to be held to account. And, and you know, I, I think one of the challenges for 2021 is, you know, without getting into petty partisan point scoring and without getting into the sort of nastiness of who said what when, we do need to make sure that we look at the structural failings uh, and recognize exactly as Hillary said that Britain went into the pandemic uh, with at least two problems you know a, a social system that was fraying and a political system that was unresponsive to the needs of communities across the country uh, you know so neither neither its social system nor its political system worked and the pandemic has revealed that and you know what we all have to get onto in 2021 is try to do something about it. Hilary, what was your what was your sense on 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 this? Do you, do you think we're at a moment of change, or do you think we're just going to sort of take our lot and live with it in a sort of sip up a lip style way? Well, absolutely, the latter is not an option. And I think you know our role is to kind of tell the stories. You know, you've given us the microphone, and you give it to other people. And our role is to tell the stories of what is different and how things can be different. I mean, there's such a clear differential in in this country and. In, in England in particular, but across the United Kingdom between the local state and the central state. And what we have seen, and perhaps this is one of the reasons that people have been patient is because actually they've benefited from the support and the radical action of their local state whilst the central state has been floundering. But I mean, more profoundly, I mean, we, we know, we've seen at every level that centralised institutions can't cope with modern problems. And we've seen that whether it's, um, you know, testing, tracking and so on, whether it's kind of supermarket supply chains, that, you know, local action, horizontal institutions and systems can respond to this as they can respond to other of the big challenges of this century in a way that the kind of vertically integrated centralised institutions can't. So absolutely, we've got to think about how we can kind of change those structures, because the sort of political economic centralization is what has brought us to this point, the kind of huge debates we're having now about why, you know, there's not an economy where people can earn decent wages that can actually, you know, they can feed their children, for example, the kind of huge story of today is, is related to this kind of over centralized decision making, whether it's about welfare structures, economic investment or political structures. So, you know, I mean, all the time I hear in the communities in the North, um, this idea about vacuous leveling up. And so I suppose one of the challenges is how do we make this not vacuous? What is going to happen? And how are we going to ensure that we can sort of take this policy opening, if you like, and really run with something different now? Yeah, so I mean, another, another supposed trade for the central state, of course, should be sort of universality and uniformity. And we've seen quite the opposite again. You know, we've seen actually a patchwork quilt full of holes, full, full of holes, um, and, you know, whole millions of people basically falling through provision um, and support. And the, the food parcels example is, is, is just the latest one in that. Now, but this, this point about stories, um, here, which you make incredibly powerfully, I think is, is a critical one. I think it probably unites the two. Well, I think a lot unites the, the, the two. But there was there, there was a there was a short paragraph in in Mark's book that really really struck me because I think it it, it it kind of is a is a point of acute con consensus which is important and it, it went uh, like this the, the idea that the answer to Britain's woes were to be found in the everyday experiences of ordinary people rather than in the grandeur of the country's vaunted traditions or in the pursuit of a revolution in economic and social order was breathtakingly countercultural in the 1930s. Is it still so? Mark? Yes, I'm afraid so. I mean, that's the key. Uh, the essence of what I want to try to argue in the book and really what we're trying to do here at, in Sydney is that you know, people are still desperate for the one-shot solution, you know, the, the moonshot. How many times have we heard Boris talk about that in the last year? You know, that there's going to be... And, what, and it keeps changing because there is no one single solution to these problems. And there's definitely no one single solution that can come from Westminster or Whitehall or from the city of London. You know, so living with complexity, living with subtlety, living with the fact that, you know, people live, uh, you know, fluid lives, changing lives and knowing how you're gonna deal with that, that's absolutely crucial. But, you know, as you say in the quote there, you know, it is so countercultural. you know, 
Um, I always tell this story, but it's it's true, so I'll tell it again, which is, you know, when I first was tempted to get involved in politics, you know, because I used to be an academic, and then, you know, I was tempted to to join, you know, um, the political fray. I used to go and visit politicians in, in Westminster, and Hillary's done this too. You know, you go to Port Cullis House, and you sit there, and, you know, the minister gives you 10 minutes of the time. The, the single question politicians always ask me, literally, they said, what's your big idea? Yeah. And I said, oh, I haven't got a big idea. You know, I actually, I want to stop you looking for a big idea because there, you know, there, there isn't a single answer which is going to solve all of your problems. There is a single approach, which we'll talk about, I'm sure, in more depth later on. You know, there are, there are certain ways of dealing with problems, you know, which are you know, from the bottom up, which are relational, which are in tune with people's lives, which are social. And all of those things, I think, you know, are in some sense universal. But there is no one grand abstract solution and we've got to stop looking for it, whether we're on the far right of politics or on the far left or in the center, you know, that the cult of abstraction and grandiosity still is with us and we've somehow got to wean ourselves away from it. It's so, I mean, and the thing is you discuss in the book, I mean, I, 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 the, the two things seem to bind them, a, a number of things do, but two particular things, you know, the Priestleys, the Orwells, the Dylan Thomases that you that you mentioned, and before them sort of D.H. Lawrence, so it, it seems to be the sort of, you know, the, the, the sort of social, cultural sort of father figure in, in many respects of, that, of what was an intellectual movement, so they didn't have that sort of self-consciousness of the movement. But the two things are sort of, they like people, that seems to be important, you know. If you're going to exist in, a, in, 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 in an everyday conversation, a common culture, a common cause, that seems important. And they trusted people. And I just get the sense, and Hillary, this is so powerful in in your work as well. Far too often, you know, the mechanisms of democracy, of the state, of the market, and so on, don't really sort of convey a sense of either liking people or trusting them. Well, I think that's right. I mean, that's why, you know, I put relationships at the heart of my work, because, you know, relationships are the very opposite to the sort of transactions of the market. But um, also, can I, I just want to say sort of on the story point is that that we also have to kind of we've got deep legacy issues. We've you know, you've got them in Australia. We've definitely got them in Britain. And so also the stories we tell have to kind of unpack that legacy. And so, I, you know, this morning we're talking about optimism, but it can't be a sort of it has to be a critical optimism, doesn't it? Not a nostalgic optimism. So the other thing that I kind of want to put kind of centrally on the table, I suppose, in this conversation are the sort of the legacies and the kind of deep injustices on which the current current systems have been built of, of race, for example. We know that, you know, if we think about Black Lives Matter, a a lot of the energy through this pandemic has come from those kinds of movements, um, gender as well, the kind of spatial spatial injustices and all of that. And I think it's really, you know, another, there's so much that we could talk about in Mark's book that I've enjoyed so much. But Mark, one of the things is you tell about Dylan Thomas's story, um, the play, The Londoner, it's called The Londoner. Is it called The Londoner? Yeah. Um, you know, where sort of somebody comes from outside and says, oh, you know, what a dreadful place. And then people who live there start to talk about, oh, yes, but remember the depth and the, you know, and I thought about, you know, how we've all been treated to Steve McQueen's small acts films, for example, over this period, which in exactly the same way kind of, um, sort of bring a history, you know, begin to kind of open up the multiple histories we've got and tell that kind of richness. And I think that that's all, recovering that is also really important because I think we've got to be honest that one of the reasons that our structures worked at all is because they kept people out and they were so narrow. So the new structures that we invent can't work in that way. It can't be just sort of recovering that in some way. I'm really glad you wrote. That's that's exactly where I was going next in the conversation. Was was the how how anti-racism and Black Lives Matter fits within the everyday democracy framework? And you know, we've all lived in very diverse communities, which under the surface often are actually very separate and 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 segregated. Once you start to start to borrow down with with sort of grotesque range of of of, of opportunities and 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 equalities in life. And I just wonder how much of the everyday democracy approach can actually solder those communities together. I mean, is there a risk of that, that, that you know, under Milk Wood ultimately is about a community that that has you know a common ethnicity, identity, culture, um, and so on? How can we enable a variety of stories to be part of that everyday democracy tale? Is there a risk actually we it, it, it entrenches separateness? Um, or is it a mechanism by which we can confront some of these deep structural injustices and legacy issues that Hillary talks about? I'll go to Mark and then Hillary on this. Yeah, it's such a profoundly important question. I mean, in the background of 
you know, the work I've done on this, actually I started, sorry, 15 years ago, um, because I became obsessed with understanding the civil rights movement in the US in the 1950s yeah. and 60s for various reasons. Um, and you know, the first thing that I learned as I studied the civil rights movement was that you know all of your textbook assumptions go to the big moments, you know, the March on Washington or Lyndon Johnson passing, you know, passing the Voting Rights Act, and uh, and there's a sort of grandeur and there's an excitement about that, and of course those were absolutely crucial moments in the story, but actually the roots of the movement lay in community by community organizing and change, which went back into the middle of the 1930s. You didn't just start bang in, in the 50s or the 60s. You know, it has a very slow, long um, history behind it, which started on street to street and workplace to workplace and school to school organizing, often across racial lines. You know, often these were coalitions of, uh, for example, the white dominated trade unions working with African-American communities. Um, so initially they weren't sort of segregated uh, organizing efforts. Um, but the crucial aspect to it is that it's community-led change, which is actually the predecessor uh, and the precondition for the larger civil rights success. And, and, and I guess that's where I always go, you know, ever since doing that research. Whenever I'm thinking about how do we tackle these grand structural injustices of the moment, um, I'm always tempted by, you know, by the work like the Steve McQueen work that Hillary refers to, is that the answer is not going to lie, sadly, on the front page of The Guardian or in the Labour Party manifesto or in a big speech by Jeremy Corbyn to hundreds of thousands of people. It's going to you know, lie in community by community work for change. And one of the things I try to do in the book is, is just to show how much exciting work like that is currently going on. You know, um, I was privileged to be able to work with we Belong, the, 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 the charity which is run um, by uh, young migrants for young migrants in London, started as a movement for undocumented migrants to try and get them the right to go to university in the UK. And the kind of slow, detailed neighborhood school-based organizing they have done, that's where the real big prospects for change lie. Um, and so again, that, my instinct here is always like, the problems are big, but the solutions start local or start small. Uh, and we've got to acknowledge that if we're going to make the kind of headway that we're all looking for uh, in 2021. Yeah. It, it's, the, it's the reach across the, the aisle, the, the moral, am I not a man and a brother um, or a woman and a sister um, that I think are so, so, so powerful. And the realization that you are living common lives, even if you've been separated through structures of culture, power, uh, 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 economy. Hillary, how, where 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 are you on this? Do you do you, do you see a risk in everyday democracy being being a, a separatist thing, um, or or do you think we can be afford, afford to be optimistic about it, optimistic about this? Well, I, I mean, I actually think that the practice of kind of making change and doing things together is what changes this. And actually, I just want to read a book, uh, you know, there's so much in Mark's book, but I just want to kind of read a little bit that he wrote to this, which is that he says, the challenge for our lives ceases to be how each of us can play a part in improving an imaginary future state and instead becomes how we can learn to avail ourselves of every means necessary to extend our experience in the now and the repeated nows to come. And I think everything is in that, that small piece there that you wrote, Mark. And I mean, just to sort of go to my own experience, you know, one of the things we did and that I write about, I think it's the fifth experiment in radical health is about circle the work with older people where we built communities to offer support. And when we started that, we had this idea, you know, we started in Southwark where I live, um, which is a very sort of diverse community. But as you say, Anthony, you know, underneath is very sort of still segregated. So we had the idea that, you know, an older lady um, from who kind of her heritage might be sort of in the West Indies would want somebody who had that similar heritage to come in and keep her company. And, and we started in that way. And we were completely wrong, actually. We, as we learned, we just realised we didn't need those boundaries, that people could connect over those divides mutual things that interested them and that that experience of building something together and feeling not that this was something that we owned that they could join but that they were building it meant that all those divisions fell apart and I think that that's also something I think is profoundly optimistic although difficult about this time which is that we have had to get together to support you know we've supported one another in our streets and we've done this in this very democratic way I mean the other thing I think is really important is that we've had centrally organized volunteering systems like the Prime Minister's NHS system which 
hundreds of thousands of people have signed up to. And of course, virtually nobody has been called to help because nobody wants to feel something is done to them. This is the relational point that Mark and I make. You want to feel that you're part of this, you own it, you're building it. Of course, in my street, we all know who are the people who might need more help and who are the people that can give help. But it doesn't have that feeling. It has that kind of neighborly practice. So I think what is really different is that when you actually do something instead of talking about it, you know, when it's not a political meeting, but it's a kind of like, let's organize to make this happen, this childcare happen this park be renovated whatever it is you roll up your sleeves and you get into something all of that falls apart so what needs to happen are the frameworks then that allow us to do that because at the moment that is happening and it's really grown in this pandemic but still into a headwind that's coming from Westminster which is you know the guidelines say this the risk framework is this we ultimately know better if we can let that go so that we can have the practice of everyday democracy things really begin to change I think. A lot of progressives are nervous about this, aren't they? You know, this, this is this is the irony of, this, of, of, of the situation. And maybe it's in the historical moment that we that, that, that we found ourselves to, to a certain extent. I mean, the, the, the connection of sort of everyday sensibility and culture against sort of abstract systems and the deployment of those two forces um, counter one another has been most effective in the context of Brexit and actually Trump against sort of the, the, the Washington um, consensus and, and establishment. Are, are progressives right to be nervous uh, 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 about a, a politics and democracy grounded in the everyday of this, or have they just not fundamentally got the programme? Hilary? Well, I think maybe you should go to Mark first on this, because he's the one with the experience of the of the politicians. But I think this also goes sort of into very deep class divides. I mean, you know, you're sort of, you know, posh and you go to a posh university and you read PPE and then you have ideas and you write pamphlets or you're not so posh and you go and do something practical and you make stuff happen. And there's this sort of huge, very British tension between sort of thinking and doing. And ultimately, of course, one of the things that's going to change our frameworks is bringing things together. And, you know, this is sort of in my manifesto for a fifth social revolution. It's all about making and it's making in place because it's sort of exploring those ideas. And, you know, you're using the term everyday democracy and Tessie Britton in her work in Barking and Dagenham in this country, for example, has really taken that and made that live through, through practice. It's about power, isn't it? I mean, ultimately, you know, it's about, and, and sort of on both sides of the political spectrum, there's a distrust for very different reasons about allowing people to kind of, to, to have their sort of, to, to design their way through this and to kind of understand that different knowledges can come together. I mean, the work I do is not sort of bottom up in the in the idea that I just think, well, you can go and sit somewhere and ask people what they think and you'll come up with the answer because you have to blend different knowledges. Of course, you know, we, yeah. we do learn things through data and through reading and what's been tried elsewhere. So one of the most important things, I mean, one of the things I've been calling for for a long time is to take away inspection frameworks and make them learning frameworks. Because in all the communities I work in, you know, Bradford, Barnsley, you know, or talking, I mean, I'm not working in Barnsley, but I, I was there yesterday talking with leaders there, um, Barrow, there's an absolute hunger to know what's happening elsewhere. We've got these ideas. How can we learn? How can we be connected to capital, to knowledge in new ways? And, and so until that happens, I can see some sort of suspicion. But ultimately, you know, we have to have new developmental frameworks sort of about valuing knowledge in different ways and, and, you know, take away that power that is sitting in the wrong place right now. But your, your book is very um, sceptical about what, what I guess you could term a sort of Fabian sensibility or approach or, or a technoc technocratic approach in many respects which is sort of pamphleteers uh, professionalism that, that that hillary is talking about uh, fundamentally you know if we are, are to bring together thought analysis knowledge that is cognitive with lived experience and conviviality and solidarity and learning together how do you stop the professionals always being the ones in charge yeah i mean this is the crucial issue and i mean hillary puts her finger exactly on it when she says it's really about power, even though people never admit that it is. You know, I'm, I, I always draw on my, my wife's work here. So Liz Pelicano is my wife. She's an autism researcher. And, you know, about 10 years ago, she thought, well, let, let's find out what, what work gets done on autism. So what does the government fund and what do the experts research? And then compare that with the, uh, the work that autistic people themselves and their families and communities uh, would like to see done. And the gulf is just, it's extraordinary. Almost all of the research money in the UK in autism goes to uh, sort of biological, medical, genetic research. 
And if you actually talk to autistic people and their families and their communities, they say, well, um, we actually really need proper research on how on quality of life, uh, on our opportunities in the labor market, on schooling and the opportunities there, uh, on you know, how do autistic people bring up their own kids. You know, there's huge amounts of real social questions, fundamental social questions, which are just absolutely unresearched and unfunded within the UK at the moment, which is one of the world's leaders in autism research. And, and you think about, okay, how did we get to that situation? It's because the autistic people and their families and communities were never at the table when the decisions were made about how the research funds get allocated. So government decides it wants to compete in some international rankings table, and so that's where the money goes. Or academics decide that they, they really want to make the big genetic breakthrough that's going to be great for their career. And they, you know, they, they believe that it's going to be really important, so that's where the money goes. And when you make this point, I've been making this point now for a very long time, when you say it to people, especially academics, their first reaction is, you know, you're like Michael Gove, you know, you don't believe in expertise, you want to give away, you know, all, you know, all decision making to ordinary people, that's a disaster, you're not going to have good quality science if you do that. You say, look, you know, when did I ever say that? No one's saying that all decisions ought to be on plebiscite or, you know, on a, some sort of Zoom voting system. What in fact you're saying is that we need relationships between those people whose lives are affected by the research, those people who fund the research, and those people who do it. Say so a third, a third, a third. And let's get them around some sort of table decision-making opportunity, create connection, create mutual understanding, and then reimagine what we can do together. So you'll still have to have you know, proper medical, biological, genetic research, but you'll also have research on services. Uh, and you'll have people at the table who are a bit able to reflect on their own experience and bring new insights and new perspectives to bear. And, and I guess you could probably hear it in my voice. The thing that gets me most frustrated is, you know, that's not an attack on expertise. That's making expertise better. You know, it's bringing different kinds of wisdoms together so that we'll get better quality work and it will make more of an impact upon people's lives. And that's really what I'm trying to say in the book is like, don't be disdainful of ordinary experience. Don't think that ordinary experience is the thing that's just going to solve all your problems. Of course it's not. But it's got to be part of our solution if we're going to tackle the vast social injustices that we're confronted with today. And, and can I come in here just a moment, just to kind of, I mean, I think this is such an important point and kind of is where it gets crunchy. Because if we think, for example, about family life in Britain today, which is something I work on, it's extremely difficult. We know that it's, you know, wherever you are in the spectrum, all kinds of different economic schooling pressures and everything else are very difficult. But we also know that those pressures are acute if you're in poverty. And we know that children are removed from their families at this astonishing rate. And that we've got a care system that is utterly overwhelmed. You know, if we've got 57,000 children in care in this country, even though the money is, is not there, no amount of money can actually take care of 57,000 children in a state system. So, if you know, where in the world have they kind of tackled this? Well, New York has got brilliant example. And how, uh, how they did it was they actually, just as Mark's saying, they asked families. So they brought together the families whose children have been removed and who have got children in care. And they said to them, we'll sit alongside you, how can we solve this problem? And it, the results are absolutely dramatic. Now, probably in this country, we're going to have some inquiry where kind of, you know, a couple of some lead professionals get together and they talk about how to have risk frameworks and make sure those children are no longer in quite, you know, put into pubs or wherever they're put right now. It's just horrific what's happening. But what they won't do is have a more sort of poverty truth kind of approach to it, which is where we'd have a family commission. And exactly as Mark is saying, we would sit professionals because we have to have professionals. I mean, they join those professionals because they want to make change, they have profound insight, but need to sit in these interdisciplinary teams. And this is kind of, you know, the metaphor really is like, in everything, let's get horizontal, you know, let's have, you know, neighbours next to families, next to professionals, next to politicians, um, and, and think in a different way rather than this kind of approach that we have at the moment. But this and, is in, really and amongst, amongst, amongst families in a situation of, of poverty, of course, one, one of the, the, the most enormous sort of manifestations of that actually is a lack of time, cognitive space, space more, more, more broadly and so on. And, and this, this comes down to this intersection of people's lives, what the philosopher Habermas calls their life world, which is about their, their, their relationships, their everyday, the community they live in, the, the cultures they, 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 they inhabit. And these big systems of power, money, economy, um, or technology that kind of invade that 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 life world, if you like, and and I guess maybe something that can connect the everyday 
democracy, everyday life, those those life worlds to real fundamental change are, are, are interventions, if you like, or approaches or ways of thinking that can really widen that 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 life world to enable people to work through their their their, their challenges with others in a way that makes sense to them. Which I think is what you're kind of describing, Hilary. I mean, that's crucial, Anthony, if I, if I just come in and, and say, but you only discover that when you're able to do the listening. I mean, that's the, yeah. that's the, that's the, that's the first move. I mean, my, when I was um, at New Economics Foundation, my colleague Rachel Lawrence did a wonderful piece of work with uh, single mums in Pimlico, working out why they weren't taking up training opportunities that the government had created for them. Uh, and, you know, the, 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 the government had come up with all kinds of explanations for why the training wasn't being used. You know, yeah. you could see spreadsheet after spreadsheet. Uh, and the fact was, all Rachel did was she sat down with people and talked to them and said, well, why aren't you going to the training courses? And they said, well, the schools are over here. The only affordable shops are over there. The bus station is over there. Yeah, and here is my, here's my daily timetable. And I've got to drop the kids off, you know, when I've got to get the shopping in. And it's like, and the, the actual you know, sessions, these training sessions were scheduled in a place which was inaccessible at a time which wasn't doable. And it's so simple, but nobody knew any of that because nobody was in relationship with the, with, with the people who were meant to be being helped by the system in itself, you know. So, I mean, it's not always as simple as that, but often it is. It's just that nobody has taken the time to talk with and listen to and engage with the people that particular social interventions are meant to assist and I, that's I guess, the first move that we've got to shift. Yeah I, I guess I'm, what, what I'm wrestling with here though Mark, Mark I, I think listening is, is, is critical, better service design is absolutely critical but at the other end of the spectrum you've got these big power structures and inequalities and there are vested interests and path dependencies in there and it feels to me like an everyday democracy, it might be David versus Goliath in this and actually how can David defeat Goliath um, when, when we've got that sort of spectrum of challenge, Hillary. Well, I mean, I want to go to the sort of subject of economics, which you, yes. which was in your question to Mark, and also you touched on in a very kind of important way earlier on. So, I mean, I think that one of the critical problems we've had in recent decades is we've had kind of discussions about uh, the social sector, whether it's sort of welfare, public services, social reform, um, even politics completely devoid from our economic system, which is actually sort of determining all of this. So I think, you know, we're talking about optimism and one of the most important things I think has happened is that we are seeing this, a new orthodoxy growing in economics, which is partly about, always it's like this, it's partly about recovering older things we've forgotten about, Ostrom, the commons, that kind of different imagining. It's about new forms of value, uh, Mariana Matsukatu's work, Stephanie Kelton's work, uh, Carlotta Perez's work, which thinks about that value in terms of the technology revolution. And then of course, really critically, it's about the ecological disaster which we're sort of heading into and how we think about reuse, reimagine, you know, whether it's degrowth, no growth. So of course, um, the work of Kate Rayworth, who spoke recently at the RSA, uh, Bounds, these kinds of people. And I think that this is coalescing into something very different. And this is really important because so long as ultimately the framework is about growing GDP and having at its heart this idea of homo economicus, that we are ultimately, you know, we see this education systems are talked about how to make us more productive, how to make us better cogs in the wheel. This points to a kind of new, I mean, I've, I've had this imagining with um, Anne-Marie Slaughter about the idea of sapiens integra, that really, if we understand ourselves as humans, as wanting to kind of have all the things you just referred to, Anthony, sort of different forms of time, work, play, certainly time to relate to one another, to care to one another, then we begin to design a very different form of economics and then that makes possible very different social systems. So I think part of this is reconnecting the two and I think that is just beginning to happen. And the more that we can kind of talk about that, push that, investigate it, the more important it becomes. Because the kinds of social problems and the kinds of social attitudes that Mark and I are talking about are directly related to sort of economic forms that have begun to kind of talk about sort of social beings in this sort of language of, you know, whether it's risk or productivity that is just extremely narrowing. And so this liberation that's coming through ideas of economics is really important and linking to that, I think is also what's going to kind of move everything forward. Yeah, there's no doubt. I mean, and, and it's not just those in poverty. There is sort of widespread economic insecurity and job insecurity of different types as well. And there's no doubt the economic world is 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 occupying a far greater space um, in, in our in our lives, in our in our family lives that is that, that is critical. We, we did some um, 
opinion polling over um, over over the course of Christmas. And one of the encouraging things in 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 that is that there does seem to be some sort of commonalities which can be built on. People are committed actually to to achieving our targets on net zero, for example, coming into the, the climate emergency uh, conversation. They, they are relatively comfortable with diversity um, actually, and they do want power devolved, although they never they don't believe actually it will be despite levelling up agenda and, and so on. So I wonder, Mark, is there a way, you know, in, in terms of the, the, the sort of big transformational systemic change, which I think is a critical part of this, um, of, 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 of this mission, do those sort of commonalities give us a sort of fertile ground on which to develop new stories that can lead to larger transformations? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I, I think that's a, it's a brilliant um, uh, way of putting it. I mean, the, 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 the essence, I think, of what we're trying to talk about today is that we all, all three of us, agree that there are huge challenges which need huge systemic transformation. I don't, you know, climate, Hillary has rightly pointed to, um, you know, you see it also, of course, in, in social life, in economic life, in the inequalities that we've seen, you know, growing over the last 40 years, but becoming extraordinarily intense. And um, my friend Danielle Allen in the US calls it the great coming apart. You know, it's like a, a system which has just about held itself together is now sort of fractured in all kinds of ways. Um, and so, you know, we need big action in order to, to change that. The, the challenge I think that I want to lay out to people watching is to say, okay, yeah, that's, that's you know, the scale of the problems are enormous. That doesn't mean you start with a single enormous solution. Because actually, if you're gonna have big change to grapple with those big problems, you're going to have to build it. Uh, you know, it doesn't happen overnight. And, and all of us in our different ways can play a part in creating the momentum for that change. You know, you can do it in your own workplace, you can do it in your own charitable activities, you can do it through reimagining if you're a thinker, you can do it by recreating disciplines like economics as Hillary has described. So there's a multiplicity of means into this but the thing that we've got to avoid, you know, I'm trying to argue in the book, is this tendency to, to say, because the problems are big, you need a single one size fits all immediate solution, which is also you know, big. And that is mythical thinking, that's illusory thinking, and that gets you nowhere is essentially the, the claim I wanna make, that there are big, bold, exciting things that we can do, but they start in areas which are often overlooked because people think that they are irrelevant or small or mundane or parochial. Um, so, you know, and, and that is basically the argument that all the people I talk about in my book, you know, Dylan Thomas is my hero, you know, Welsh poet, uh, but also a great political thinker. And, and Dylan always used to say, look, you know, the magical and the parochial aren't at odds with each other. You only reach the magical if you embed yourself in the parochial. You start local, you build relationships, you see what change you can bring. And that takes you to the big transformations that we want you know, to, to be able to create. And my own instinct as a historian is that the history of social change proves that point again and again and again. None of the big transformations we've seen in gender, sexuality, race rights have ever happened by a big bang, simple systemic answer coming from a think tank. You know, they've always come from complex coalition building, relationship building, which starts local and then becomes grander as time progresses. That's bad luck for the think tanks, isn't it? Um, I, I hope over Christmas, I was also reading um, the, the new book by um, uh, Putnam and Romney Garrett, The Upswing, and uh, there's lots in it. Um, uh, I don't agree with all of it, um, and I've written a piece saying where I, where I disagree, but fundamentally where it ends up is where you've ended up, Mark. Actually, this is it's a movement of millions of different voices, different perspectives, from investigative journalists to um, you know, the FDRs, the, the Theodore Roosevelt, to the community organisations and so on. And it was a movement over some considerable time and with enormous energy that needed persistence. And that was the thing that dragged America and probably a lot of other Western democracies from where they were at the end of the 19th century to where it's possible for them to be um, after after the Second World War. Mark said where, where he would start, Hillary, where would you start? I agree, of course, that ultimately, I mean, what, you know, because I work on the welfare state and I also take a historical perspective, I'm drawn to a different part of the Second World War than, than Mark says works with speechwriters, but it is the fact that the experience of, of of the Second World War meant that we got to know each other again, that people had to drop their lazy assumptions about each other because they were working shoulder to shoulder, whether it was on the front line or whether it was kind of at home doing different things. And I think that something like that has happened now um, and is still happening. I mean, we're very much still in the middle of this. 
Um, and also, I mean, that's why it's important, actually, you know, I suppose what we've talked about, the incompetence of leadership at the centre of government. But what we also haven't talked about is that the stories they're telling are not helpful, actually, in kind of fermenting and bringing us together even further, which is what we need right now. But I think it doesn't matter to, it, to some extent because we're experiencing it, we're living it in our communities. So we're getting to know each other once again. And that's really, really important in terms of now thinking about transition really we've got to make profound transitions in our economic our political our social structures because otherwise you know in fact the biggest problem is climate change and and that's going to be kind of we're not going to kind of get out of this before we're kind of reeling from from the immediate effects of that so again that starts by thinking in in place about how do we form an economy how do we kind of create work which moves from from sort of brown work to green work as it were how do we think about supporting families through that transition how do we think about what education is but all of this has to be rethought because just to kind of go back to where you were before um you know to the economics point is that I'm working with places across the UK that have landed quite a lot of money in town deals but all these town deals are now about building roads widening the airports yeah. So now they've all landed this money and they're saying, but really what we want, you know, we've read the donut. We want that kind of transition. How on earth can we do that? We're kind of locked into this, which is right back to the centre, to where we started this conversation about um, power structures from the centre. So I really hope that the sort of conversation about levelling up allows a sort of really honest conversation that nobody has got the answers, that this is a kind of, you know, what David Tucker at UCL calls radical uncertainty. And that in that, where in that moment we need to work exactly as Mark is talking about through kind of alliances, through experimentation, through working from one thing to another. It's true, there's no silver bullet. There's no sort of management textbook of 10 great you know, lessons that we can all move from. So I really hope that this will be a moment that those structures can loosen because then I think we know what to do and we can get going. Thank you. Well, I'm gonna finish on a, on, on a reflection. Um, and as I was reading Mark's book, um, it, it kind of occurred to me that of, of, of course, you know, all three of us are in privileged positions because we're well educated and, you know, we're, we've got necessary resources and, and, and so on. But I can't remember a single occasion when I've been given any real power over anything that has happened locally to me. I can't remember. There was one instance where I was involved with a campaign that was successful um, about a redesign of a road system. Um, and then the council did it anyway, six months later, but in a more piecemeal fashion. And that wasn't me driving a campaign. It was local people, everyday people who need, who are nurses and delivery drivers and so on that needed to be able to, to work and blend with their family. But there we go. So, you know, if we are not given that, 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 that power, then I can't imagine pretty much anybody is. And there's something fundamentally wrong uh, in that. And maybe that's a, 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 a starting point. And it comes back to a thematic across three of us, I think, which is maybe do start by giving people power and trusting them. And not only will we be surprised, but we can see big radical change coming out of that. It's been a great conversation. Um, I, I'd be amazed if you haven't read Radical Help. Um, and if you haven't, you should do very, very quickly, uh, as well as Welfare 5.0. And you definitely should read uh, Out of the Ordinary by, by Mark. It's, it's, it's brilliant. It's lyrical, it's aesthetic, it's poetic, but deeply um, political. And um, we've run out of time. We've probably gone over time, but hopefully you'll agree that it was, um, it was, it was worth it. Um, do follow up on the RSA's work in a number of these um, areas. We do a lot of work on the future of work, on economic insecurity, on regenerative futures, on lifelong learning, on place. And we try to bring together people and ideas and social change, as everybody in this conversation does in their different different settings. That's all on our website. But thank you very much for all joining the three of us um, today um, and enjoy the rest of your Thursday.